This, there's a mistake. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. You like me right now. You like me. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted this. Mom, I just want an Oscar. I'm Connor Old, and welcome back to another episode of the Ultimate Oscar Showdown. And this week, we're going to be looking at the 1970s Best Picture winners and ranking them into different tiers. But if you're new to the series, what I do every single week, or have been for the past three or four weeks now, you guys have been showing a lot of support, still a new series, so I do appreciate that. Essentially, what we've been doing is going from the decades, we started in the 2010s, now we're in the 70s, and ranking the 10 Best Picture picture winners of that decade into different tiers, not necessarily one from 10, but just in terms of S tier being the highest tier and then A, B, C, and D, depending on my appreciation of the movies itself. We don't consider things like what that movie beat out and we don't try to hold negative grudges that way. We just try to uh, critically analyze and appreciate the movies themselves and rank them based on that accordingly. And we're going to do this for a few more weeks for the 60s, 50s, and 40s. And then we're going to do a little bit of a change in the series. And then I'm going to rank the best actor winners and then the best actress winners going through the decades. So that's sort of the main idea of the series. We're going to continue this all throughout the summer, all the way up until next year's Oscar season 2023. So I appreciate if you just subscribe to the channel so you don't miss these videos and comment below. Let me know your best picture rankings. That stuff is a lot of fun. And of course, without further ado, let's jump into the ranking, starting off with the 1970 winner, Patton. And I always thought about this movie as a sort of older best picture winner, that it almost never felt like a 70s best picture winner. Why? Well, because we had the sort of late 60s bringing upon the new Hollywood. You had the old Hollywood um, with a sort of static camera, big production, kind of boring movies, and then you had the, the new Hollywood, which is much more about going outside, being sort of more gritty, and handheld cameras, and trying to display social themes that were going on at the times, and then that dominated really the, the American cinema of the 70s, and was the reason why I think that we had so many great films, was because there was so much experimentation and change and with advances of technology, with things like you know, more mobile, mobile cameras and whatnot. So we have this period where 69, Midnight Cowboy, we'll talk about it next week, but that is, for me, the sort of first transition of the the Academy recognizing New Hollywood. That's a movie that's set on location uh, with sort of two on the outskirts of the society protagonist with two sort of uh, burgeoning actors that wouldn't be sort of traditional A-list a a actors um, in the 50s or the 60s with uh, Dustin Hoffman and John Voight. So that felt like, oh, we're in the New Hollywood. And then when we gave the reward to Patton in 70, it felt like, Oh, it's maybe going back to, to, to old Hollywood instead of new Hollywood. But when rewatching it for this episode, I think it's actually the perfect transition airy uh, movie because it really is kind of have a, a foot in both worlds. It's got uh, the foot in old Hollywood with a lot of these sort of static dealings of the officers speaking in boardrooms and things like that. Remind me of scenes from Lawrence of Arabia, but also from movies like The Longest uh, Day, you know, 50s, 60s kind of war movies, feels like that. But then there's also the battle scenes, and I think Franklin J. Scheffner really likes to move the camera a lot, so we have more of a mobile camera, which you haven't really seen in the 60s, but becomes more common in the 70s. And then also that main protagonist of, of Patton, George Patton, who is a sort of anti-hero. He's not the traditional Hayes code, has to be this stand-up citizen kind of protagonist. He is complicated. He, You're not exactly sure how you're supposed to feel about him. And that's really the success of, of the film. It's the combination of character, which is really well written by Francis Ford Coppola, but then also the combination with uh, George C. Scott, who is the perfect person to play Patton. I think this is a similar instance when Gregory Peck played Atticus Finch or Robert Downey Jr. played Iron Man. The connection between actor and character is so perfect you can't identify them outside of each other. You couldn't imagine anyone else to play, say, Atticus Finch. And I think George C. Scott fits that model perfectly. I think he is Patton in this film because he's so clear in Patton's motives. I mean, this is a, a man who wore his heart on his sleeve and had these grand emotions and that helped him maneuver uh, the battlefield very well, but then hurt him in some of his maneuverings over the political field. So we have this sort of complicated protagonist. He's the best when he's on the battlefield, joyous, but then when he's not, he's intolerant and has a big temperament. So 
there is a sort of complicated feeling that you have towards Patton. And it's also a weird kind of movie because it's right in the middle of the Vietnam War, so it's sort of an anti-war movie, but it's sort of not. It's not exactly sure what it exactly wants to be. And I think it becomes more complex and more interesting because of that, but particularly just because of that sort of central performance of George C. Scott because of some interesting battle sequences and war sequences. It's got a foot in, into both worlds. Still, though, it does have some old Hollywood to it. Some of those boardroom scenes are a little bit slow. The movie does feel probably 15 or so minutes a little bit too long. I would sort of cut it down a bit. Uh, that being said, it's still a movie I enjoy quite a bit, so I'm going to put this one in the B tier. Then 1971, the winner is The French Connection, which I do think is the sort of announcement of this is the types of movies that we're going to reward. This is the new Hollywood, and, and really throughout the 70s, they continue to reward these kinds of, of movies. And this was a, another rewatch for me, like Patton was in, in anticipation of this episode. And what's interesting about the movie is that the first time around, you appreciate the obvious things. The car chase is incredible, the sort of gritty New York 70s setting. But now rewatching it, I hadn't seen it in a couple of years, now rewatching it with the understanding of what happened at the end, you start to understand the true themes of the movie a lot earlier on in the film. So if you don't want to hear me spoil French Connection, you haven't seen it, definitely go check it out, but skip ahead for the next 30 or so seconds. But that theme of the fact that this is not really about the case or the heroin or the drug busting, but really a character study about Popeye Doyle in particular and his obsession with the job and his sort of morphing from having somewhat of a social life to just being so obsessed with the chase, being so obsessed with his job, that his social life and his work merge together. So that by the time we get to the end and he kills his, his, his partner cop, he's not even phased. He's just so into it. He's become so obsessed. He's gone so far into this criminal underworld and so involved in it that he doesn't see the forest for the trees. And it's a scary, kind of a haunting, ambiguous slightly, but not totally, ending in my opinion because I still think you know his fate and it's, it's one of a tragic one. So seeing it on a rewatch, you start to identify, identify those themes a, a lot earlier on. So I really appreciated that and looking at it from that viewpoint this time around unlocked a new layer for me. And it's a fascinating kind of a, a viewpoint on that end. But then of course there's all the other great stuff which is true. The car chase, that great sort of New York 70s setting which you would never get ever again. But th there's a real strength with Freakin that I think he totally understands the form of filmmaking. The visual communication on the film is intensely clear in every situation and they always rely on visual communication more so rather than just written stuff. I mean it's small things like when we get that opening tile card and we see that it's in Marseille and then who do we cut to? A man that looks like the most French man of all time and it's like okay I know where we are this man's a French man he's not an American in France and we don't need to say that we don't need to have a, a line of exposition you just look at him and you sort of understand. In the same way you know there's a great scene in which because so much of the movie is spying and trying to understand and, and police work, trying to understand what's going on without actually confronting people. There's a scene in which um, Roy Shiner's character and Gene Hackman are in a car and they're looking through uh, their car window to Sal and Angie's corner shop and they see a, a pile of newspapers and they see Sal and Angie starting to sort of manipulate them and maybe put something in them. And we have a, a reverse shot back to Gene Hackman who just looks back to uh, Roy Schneider and there's an understanding that, okay, we've got something, something's going on. This is a little bit suspicious. We don't exactly know what's going to happen, but there's no line of dialogue. They don't go back to the police um, chief and talk to them. Hey, we got a lead. They're doing this. We think, no, it's just that there's a communication between the two. We've got something here. There's something going on. Let's pursue this. And small things like that, that freaking is really sort of masterful of. And then of course that car chase scene in which we see, you know, just, the POV shots many of the car and then you, you see Pop Idol looking up and we see that there's the train so there's no sort of explanation of oh shoot he's on the train I gotta go ca chase him it's just we see a shot of the train we see the car underneath and we see that he's trying to follow it because he's trying to chase him he's trying to catch him it makes perfect visual sense and Freakin's execution of the form and visual storytelling is a master class here so it's one of the greatest crime films of all time masterpiece in my mind so it's going to go into the S tier then 1972, the winner was The Godfather. What can I say? One of the best movies of all time, a classic movie. Every department in the film is working to their absolute best. And it's an easy movie to claim as the best movie of all time because of that. Because you, whether it's Gordon Willis's, you know, incredibly uh, dark and chiaroscuro lighting, or it's 
the, the entire cast's sort of ability to realize it's a great Italian uh, American family, but then Coppola's understanding of tone and it, it's really being sort of like a Shakespearean kind of an opera in many ways too. You know, it's, it, I don't want to spend too much time on it because it's The Godfather. Everyone knows it. Everyone's seen it. If you haven't seen it, of course, please do that. It, it's one of the best movies of all time. Definitely one of the best movies of the 70s and probably my preferred favorite over Godfather 2 just because it's a little bit more light in tone and it, it's got, so it's a little bit more rewatchable on that sense. So for me, I'd probably go Godfather 1 over 2, but still, it's obviously an S tier movie. 1973, The Sting, maybe the least successful of all the Best Picture winners from this decade, but still a really great, fun caper comedy. And, you know, that's saying something if this is sort of the least successful of all the winners of this decade, because, you know, that's, if, if this is the least successful, that's pretty indicative that this was a great decade. You know, I really do think this, is, this was probably the best decade of American cinema in the 70s, of all time really, the 70s. You can go back to maybe the 40s too, was, was pretty great, and then I would even argue into the 90s, but once you get into the 90s and even 2010s day, we're getting so much international films and, and the world has become so much more smaller that it's hard to define in that way. But for this period, if we're talking about all time great, just American films, this is why the Oscars are so great here, is because there's so many great you know, movies being nominated as well. So, and The Sting was a huge success, it was a huge box office success, and it makes sense so, because the great co combination of chemistry between Robert Redford and Paul Newman, it's two of the best on-screen sort of duos of, of all time. And this is a total movie that's just about play, just sitting down, having fun with it, whether it be that opening title sequence, which is so great, which introduces the actors and the characters they're gonna be playing as players. It feels kind of, in a way, like a play, but a, a meta sort of understanding that this is gonna be a fun time, that there's gonna be lots of twists in the story. You think it's gonna be one way, but then something else, but then actually there's a double cross in this, this person. And it's just fun to sort of sit down, go along on the ride, have these sort of intense, funny sequences. You don't have to think too much. Uh, so it is a great, enjoyable movie. Nothing's necessarily groundbreaking, but a lot of fun. And it's going to go into that B tier. 1974, The Godfather Part Two, Like the first Godfather, some, one of the best films of all time. And a different kind of a movie, which is interesting. Of course, you have that dual, dueling narrative structure, which has been copied so much time with the fall of Michael Corleone and the rise of Vito Corleone, played beautifully by two of the best actors of all time maybe at their peaks, in, in, or at least at the sort of early peaks of their careers, because you know, we're talking about Pacino and De Niro, they probably had three or four peaks in, in their career. But it's different than The Godfather because it has that dueling narrative, but also because it's less of an ensemble movie, where the first one very much is an ensemble of all the different members of the family. This one is about Michael. Now, if you were to make a sequel, you would, of course, focus it on Michael because he's the most interesting character from the first part. But it's still fascinating to see how it's a, it's a different movie. It's a sequel, but it's a different kind of a movie. And just that sort of central factor of the man trying to be something that he's not meant to be and his life crumbling around from that. And, you know, certain sequels like to be bigger and better. Godfather Part Two is just different. And it's equally as good, but it, it is a, di a different movie. And even you know, there's certain things like Gordon Willis, I think, up his game even more in terms of the cinematography side, leading into the, the darkness, leading into, I think, even more yellows and golds in the film. Really beautiful. I think this is Pacino's best performance. Diane Keaton, at least for a dramatic performance, it, it's right up there for her. Anyways, you know The Godfather Part II is great. Everyone knows it. It's a masterpiece. Once again, another S-tier movie. Can you tell this is going to be a great decade? 1975's winner was One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is a classic movie for a lot of people, and never a movie I totally, absolutely love, but one I totally appreciate and, and still really enjoy. Because it's a really easy movie to watch, it's an enjoyable movie to watch, similarly to The Sting, but unlike The Sting, I think the central performance of Jack Nicholson as McMurphy it is the Nicholson performance. It is the reason why he's been so successful as a movie star throughout the 70s and into the 2000s. And, you know, was successful in the, in the 60s, of course. But this really is the one for me when I think of Jack Nicholson, I think of this. It's really the air text because it's both hip as a movie star, incredibly likable, you understand why these guys uh, connect to him, but also him as an actor because he can sell those emotional scenes. He can understand, sell these sort of craziness that's going on, this 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 sort of reckless kind of a man who starts to understand some of the consequences and, and becomes frightened by that. So there is sort of that, that combination, but just his ability to be so charming, so fun, crazy and unhinged and insane, but still kind of likable and just sort of this joyous attitude. He is the 
strongest part of the film for me. But of course, the rest of the cast is perfect as well because they are perfectly cast. And whether it be Danny DeVito and his sort of, he has very few lines, but he's always smiling in the corner of the films. You'd like him. Uh, Brad Dorff, I think, is great to, uh, as a stutterer. Christopher Lloyd. I mean, everyone's just got the perfect faces and, and the right mannerisms. And they feel like a group. They feel like friends. They feel like sort of this cohesive uh, group together. And there is a, a genuine sense of pathos and emotion. And I think care for these characters. I think in this movie could maybe have aged poorly because, you know, these are mentally ill people not being played by mentally ill people, which maybe wouldn't have been done today. But that being said, I still think the movie has a strong heart. It has a, has a uh, appreciation for these people. It's not looking down on them necessarily. It's not using them for comedic effect. They're just funny in and uh, of themselves. And that's what makes the movies, I think, still heartwarming, but also still funny. And I do think that it's a movie that has stood the test of time. So a movie I really enjoy, not a movie maybe I absolutely love, a, a great light comedy um, with some emotional moments. So it's going to go into the A tier. 1976, Rocky, another all-time classic. I mean, just one of my favorite stories of all time, the fact that Stallone wrote this part for himself, took less money so that he could get it made, and then it becomes the biggest movie of the year, and then it wins Best Picture, and then it launches him as a movie star. It's an insane story. And it would be weird if this didn't spawn any sequels or if Stone, Sloan didn't become a big movie star. It'd be like this one weird off thing. But it did happen and everyone did fall in love with Sloan. And the Rocky sequels are good and they're still relevant today because of course Creed is, you know, a killing it at the box office with Creed 3. And, and that's a great film. So it, it's great because of the legacy, but it's also great because of a film that it it is what it is. You know, this still is a 70s gritty Philadelphia kind of a story, but it's a down and dirty kind of underdog story. Feels handmade in the way that some of those 70s movies feel. Stallone is perfect as this gentle giant. He does bring a lot of the emotion to him as, as well as the physical acumen, of course. And, and this great story, of course, with the ending that is not the traditional ending that you would think, but still it's emotionally satisfying. It's this incredibly sort of a juggling, juggling act that uh, Stallone is able to, to pull off. And of course, director John G. Appleton, we still want to give him credit too. 1976 is maybe my favorite Oscar year of all time with Taxi Driver, Network, All the President's Men, and Bound for Glory all being nominated alongside Rocky. So really, really terrific year. 75 was another great year too. Um, but still Rocky, an all-time classic for me, still relevant today. So of course, it's going in the S tier, another S tier movie for me. 1977, Annie Hall, the classic Woody Allen rom-com. And both secretly important too, in terms of the history of the rom-com. Because of course we have the 40s kind of screwball comedies, which even go back to the 30s with a movie like It Happened One Night. And that sort of continues into the 40s. And then we get a little bit of a, a deviation with like a Neil Simon, when Neil Simon was like barefoot in the park in, in the late 60s. But I still think that's almost in, in connection with screwball comedies. And then when we get to Annie Hall here, or even you can say Woody Allen's films like 72 with Play It Again Sam, we really, but I think Kenny Hall's sort of the, the defining moment where we get a new sense of the romantic comedy, where we go from the screwball comedy into the romantic comedy. And it's Woody Allen style. And it's neurotic and it's fast paced and it's kind of meta and, and it's, it's uh, discussions about things in modern day life. It does, especially this movie, in terms of the importance of the romantic comedy genre, is incredibly important. And then that continues up until 89 with when Harry Met Sally and then 90 with Pretty Woman. And that sort of introduces the um, enemies to lovers kind of a narrative. But Woody Allen did sort of reinvent the r screwball comedy into the romantic comedy. He has this transitionary period and dominated really from the 70s and, and the 80s. So Annie Hall is an important film, we know that. But is it a great film? Yes. I rewatched it once again just for the fun of it just for this episode and just confirmed all of my suspicions. Where, you know, a movie like Rocky or One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, they're movies that I think are still great today, but you still have to view them through a 70s lens. Rocky, probably if it was released today, it would be a little bit faster. They would cut out a little bit of some of the character stuff, more, more action scenes. It would still be good, but it just, in terms of the pace and the speed of things, these kind of 70s movies probably would be a little bit faster. But Annie Hall is an interesting point because I think you could release Annie Hall today with the exact same pace and everything, even the costumes and the sets and whatnot. And it would still be a massive hit. I still think it would be a very popular film. It could even still win Best Picture. Maybe not because it's a romantic comedy. That being said, I was just surprised once again when re-watching the film at just how modern it feels. You know, whether it be the sort of montage -y kind of a narrative back and forth, a non-linearity, or the fact of 
you know, the scene in which we have the subtitles of what they actually mean. You know, that's something that I would see, you, know, you could see in, in 500 Days of Summer or something that you would see in a, a comedy parody on like TikTok, for example. It, it's, it, it's so modern in that sense and still so very enjoyable. And then of course, Diane Keaton as Annie Hall, who brings a lot of the emotion to the film. I mean, just a Woody Allen movie, it would be too neurotic, it'd be too a little bit self-indulgent in his regard. So when you bring in Diane Keaton and, and him and her as, as a counterpoint to him, it, it, it's really a revelation because it feels like a real relationship, not like a co comic farce that some Rian's films are able to make. It feels emotional, feels real, feels genuine because of what Diane's bringing to the movie. So what he can bring to the comedy, but Diane can make it feel like a real relationship so that we get the both. It's a romantic comedy that's both romantic and funny and heartbreaking and sad and joyous and hopeful. It's got everything in once. I think it's one of the best romantic comedies of all time. One of my favorite Woody Allen movies of all time. A classic for sure. And, and an S tier movie for me. 1978, The Deer Hunter. A classic Vietnam War movie, but like I mentioned last week, is, I think in my mind, combined with Apocalypse Now, of not necessarily being a great Vietnam War movie, but just being a great movie about war. Because that's what it's mostly about, set during Vietnam, but more so about the effects of the war. A movie that you have to totally appreciate and can't really judge it until you see that final scene, because you get to see the beginning and the end about a movie about death, about the death of a town, about the death of people, about death about family and friends, and the fact that this impact of the war, you had this generation that was the greatest generation, the World War II veterans that came back and then their sons grow up. And now there's a new war and it's Vietnam and there's this sense of pride and duty and honor and there's this great celebration after the wedding of the boys going off to war. And then when you see them come back and we get that hard cut into Vietnam, we see how brutal it is and how even though some people live and some people die, Everyone dies at the end just because of how it affects everyone, how it affects the families and the friends of those people, how it sort of depresses the town and, and leaves them completely different people and, and something that you don't necessarily want to confront. It was the most horrific thing that's happened to this town and the, and the people within them. And the, in many ways, I think a representation of the death of the American dream, of this a sense that the 50s was a perfect nuclear family and then you have JFK and the assassination of him and then Martin Luther King and then Malcolm X and then it's like, oh, this is a little bit more sinister. And then they don't win the war in Vietnam. And it's like this sort of period where, hey, maybe America is not this idealized, greatest country in the world. Maybe there's all the dark, uncovered secrets come to light. And, and this being a representation of that, being the idealized, great, small town community, everyone likes each other, to this traumatic, traumatized, depressed town. And of course, that idea of death and how it ki and war really kills everything around it, even if it doesn't physically kill them, is perfectly represented by the theme of the Russian roulette, which is many scenes in the film and is the sort of core theme of it, being something that is random and insane, but you still put yourself through it in sort of a, a self-harm, tense, traumatized kind of a way. And of course, those scenes perfectly describe the theme, but then also are so well uh, execute in terms of their tenseness and you know, that they don't really shy away from when the guy actually shoots himself seeing the blood spurt and falling around there's no cut away to the guy's reaction you see it it's brutal it's it's tough at times so now with all that being said it's a great film there are moments that you wish were a little bit quicker that sped things a little bit up you wish this was sort of like a two hour, 40 minute movie rather than like a three hour, 15 minute movie. You still need that length because you want to see the beginning and the end. You want to know and understand these characters so that you can emotionally connect to them and relate to them. I think you could have done it with a little bit less. So that's the one thing stopping it from going into the S tier, but still a great uh, war film. I'm gonna go into the A tier for me. Then 1979, Kramer versus Kramer, the final winner here of the 1970s. And maybe a sign of things to come, a little bit less of a you know, 72 or 71 a French Connection winner and more of like an 80s kind of a winner, a little bit glossy, a little bit slicker. But that being said, I think unfairly um, criticized. This is a movie that I associate many times with Ordinary People, which of course won the next year because Ordinary People is a great family drama, but you know, it technically beat out Raging Bull, which is an all time classic. 1979, great solid family drama but it beat out uh, Apocalypse Now. So, you know, that's an all-time classic. People sort of rag on it because of that. But both movies, I think, have d developed unfair 
reputations because of the movies that they ultimately beat out. But we don't talk about that on the show because ultimately we talk about the movie. How good is the movie itself? And I think the movie is a great family drama, like Ordinary People. Different in many ways, but still solid and a different a viewpoint, particularly from the 70s. You know, if you look at a movie like Terms of Endearment, the 70s dad is like Flap, Jeff Daniels' character from that movie. Very distant, focused on work. The mother has to take care of the household. But then when we see this, it's kind of revolutionary to see a movie in which the dad has to take over, where the mother abandons the child, and he has to sort of become the modern-day father figure of today, but something that was necessarily, wasn't necessarily required of them in that generation. So it's an interesting kind of perspective of that. This is the last great, I think, Dustin Hoffman straight man performance. You know, when we get Tootsie in 82 or Rain Man in 89, he does these more, on Ish Ishtar in 87, these more untraditional, weird kind of performances. This is just a great, hey, he's a movie star, he can be a great daddy, be very sympathetic, a great actor, we like him. Um, this is his last kind of role for that. So he, he's great at that, connecting that bond between him and his son, and we really do care for him and, and their connection at the beginning of the film. And I think the first time also you hate Meryl Streep's character, how could this woman do this? She has to sort of, she abandoned her child, why, why did this happen? Last minute notice, all this stuff. But then I think on rewatch this time around and with a more modern viewpoint, I actually do think that Meryl Streep brings a lot of humanity to that character and you look at this woman as, as someone that maybe rushed into marriage and, and into motherhood too quickly and she wasn't even sure herself that she wanted and that she needed this time to go away and, and, and find herself because that's the best way she could be the best mom to this child even though we don't necessarily like the way she did it <clears throat> i think with the modern viewpoint and, and what meryl's able to to add to that character and, and some of the speeches that she gives in the limited screen time that she has is an underrated and, and secretly aged well part of, of this film at least that's how i've always uh, viewed it but a great family drama that I really enjoy and love watching, even though it can be a sad movie at times, it's still a really joyous movie too. So it's gonna go into the A tier. So look at that. I don't think we're gonna get a better <laughs> decade for even the performances or the acting rankings that I'm gonna be doing later on. Now I knew this was gonna happen. I mean, what am I gonna say? Godfather, one and two, Rocky. What am I gonna say? They're not S tier movies. Of course they're S tier movies. So no movie below B tier. Lots of great stuff here. Let me know in the comments down below what your thoughts are on this list. How would you rank them? How would you do things differently? Has it, have I been too generous on the 70s movies? We'll see. Next week, the 60s. A little bit less, but still some interesting films within there as well. So that will be fun too. But that's about it. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. That, make sure you comment below. Like I said, uh, let me know your thoughts and rankings and subscribe to the channel so you stay tuned to next week's video, the 1960s Best Picture winners rankings. But that's about it. Until next time. Stay tuned.